Greetings, colleagues. Welcome to this session on the archaeology of Arabia, and thank you to the organizers um, for pulling these papers together from in this com complicated situation. Uh, this is our title page, which ASOR has requested us to use, but I'm going to move on to the normal title, title page, which gives a few examples of the artifacts that we've discovered in our recent excavations. Uh, I'm presenting on behalf of Professor Katani, uh, Dennis Frenez, and Greg Jameson, who are the co-excavators um, uh, of this project and also researchers helping to document some of the materials. This is the Joint HAD project, uh, a, a joint project between the University of Bologna, University of Wisconsin-Madison, under the auspices of the Ministry of Heritage and Culture, Sultanate of Oman. I especially want to thank the ministry for facilitating our work at the site and all of the um, conveniences that they provide us during our stay in Oman. This season was the last season that we planned to do excavations at the site. Um, the major goals were to clarify the site size and the features, to collect more pottery for residue analysis, to determine the areas where the lagoon might have been located in the prehistoric period, and to complete the artifact documentation from previous seasons, including new drawings, scans, and photographs. We had a group of students from Bologna, we had one student from Madison, and then Professor Catani, myself, Jameson, and Frenes. Um, Florencia De Bandi was also there, and um, she was helping with some of the drawings. <clears throat> Just to, re to review where we are, we're at HD1, um, this is a sec a, a, another separate site, which we've called HD1 East, which actually has another number on the earlier uh, surveys, but um, this mound um, is the main area that we've been working in. And we're looking at it to try to understand the access to this mound from this lagoon, Al-Hajar Lagoon, which was probably where boats would have been coming to dock for fishing as well as possibly for trade. Over the last several seasons, we've been able to excavate a number of different areas on the mound, and this map is the, the result after the last season, 2018-19, uh, uh, where we determined that the site is actually extending a bit further than the protected area, and then also um, areas to the west, which we weren't able to fully investigate. We haven't really looked much more to the north, but it seems to peter out in this direction, and we've think that we have the edge of the site somewhere uh, in the east. But this season we decided to explore an area that in the past we've avoided because it's covered with a cemetery. Uh, we did two little trenches here which we call Trench G and we extended the long transect that we were doing from Trench B as far as we could to see what kinds of uh, deposits were being uh, found in this area. So we'll, I'll start just talking about the Trench B and Trench G excavations, and then we'll get back to the summary of the whole site. Um, the Trench B excavation was done pr primarily to try to collect more material that related to um, black slip jars and Harappan or Indus material that might have been coming to the site from, from uh, trade. This is the trench that the British Museum excavated in 1986. They found a large number of, of black slip jars here and also the copper ingot. So we expanded to the south and were able to collect materials uh, right underneath the surface as well as a surprise discovery which was a large piece of wood. And uh, Greg Jameson found this wood. I became extremely excited about it because I thought maybe this was a preserved piece of of timber from one of the boats. Um, after very careful excavation and determining that it was covered with actual Indus pottery analytics, which suggested that it was actually buried in an ancient deposit, I figured out that this is actually an ancient deposit redeposited on top of a modern piece of wood. So this is a, is a modern piece of wood, um, termite eaten. Uh, there were two pieces of it but we very painstakingly excavated it and documented the whole thing. And then we took it out and threw it away, so it's not really worth saving. Um, but it gave us experience of what we would have to do if we did find a wooden beam. 
Uh, Arvind Matur, who is one of my new graduate students, is planning to work on residue analysis, and he was able to excavate and collect samples for, of, of uh, pottery of black slip jars, which we're planning to study uh, in great detail, and collect soil samples from around them, which also helps us to understand the context. So this is part of an actual in-situ hearth, or a burned area with, with a bunch of, of, of uh, debris. The overall discussion of pottery that we found this season was basically what we found in the previous ones. We found uh, quite a bit of Harappan um, Indus pottery. We have some reworked Indus pottery, which was used as a scraper, and then some Uman Nar pottery. We also did some more trenches along this transect to try to understand the topography of the, 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 the natural surface. So the natural surface is down here, and this is the uh, what looks like a ashy layer of black, sandy, and ash mixed material with some uh, artifacts, some copper, some sherds, and we assume that this is where humans were interacting along the edge of the lagoon. Um, but after looking at the lagoon, we see that the lagoon itself, this is a modern, the modern lagoon, we see uh, similar types of deposits of red sandy material at one level, um, yellowish sandy with the high tide uh, areas and then underneath that is the kind of um, anaerobic blackish material that is organic. And so if we look back at this slide some of that blackish material might actually be anaerobic uh, lagoon deposit which is overlying a cleaner uh, lagoon um, sediment. So this is underneath this you can see the lighter sandy material which is covered by this anaerobic material. So it's possible that we are actually at the edge of the lagoon here with some human materials or anthrop anthropogenic materials percolating down into this layer. So one idea that I have is that this is actually a channel for the lagoon coming up here and that this is the area where boats might have been brought up or dragged up in, at high tide. And that might explain why there's a large number of pot sherds right in this location, which would be where things that came in boats would be offloaded. Now, if you are traveling across the sea and a bunch of your pottery is broken during the transport and there's a storm, uh, the chances are all of the contents have been redistributed or put into other containers and you just have a bunch of broken pottery. So you just dump that on the beach and leave it there. So that might be why there's this large concentration of black slip jars located right in this location. So I don't know how we can test this in the future, but that's something that um, we will try to understand when we do residue uh, analysis. We also have extended these trenches further to the, east, to, the, to the west, and in this area we found more hearths. So basically this is a kind of void in between where there's less act human activity but over here we started getting more hearths and more human activity so that's when we decided to investigate this small mound which we assumed was a third millennium mound topped by a cemetery but because of the cemetery we didn't want to disturb it but we got permission to excavate two trenches and we eventually moved into this in this area um, so the first day of survey, which was actually the last day that Greg Jameson was there, he was walking across the surface and he picked up a pot shirt. Um, it, it looked like it had a black painted design and it read into slip, so we were very excited because it was right on the surface. And I assumed that it had been dug up in the process of digging a grave, so hopefully there would be deeper deposits with more material in it. Um, so we continued the excavation with the um, three Italian, four Italian students who were there and dug two trenches in between the graves. So we were avoiding the graves, but we drew narrow trenches in between them to try to reach the natural soil and understand the, 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 the um, stratigraphy. Below the surface, we found the other half of the sherd, or we've actually found two more fragments of that sherd. So that sherd actually was dug up in the process of digging a grave. So the one that was found on the surface, and this is the one that matches it uh, in, the, in the lower level. And this is in between a grave. So there's a grave over here, and then there's a grave over here, and in between is this Umanar deposit with a Harappan shirt, painted shirt. 
Uh, we also found you know, the, the, uh, some clay structures, which turned out to be a top of a ceiling for a grave. So this is a bunch of clay that was deposited in here to kind of seal a, 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 a burial. So we excavated around it and we we're able to reach the natural soil. So we were able to get the whole profile and understand the depth of the site in this area to help understand the overall contours of, this, of the mound. Um, after excavation, we filled in all our trenches and then um, sp spent the rest of the season documenting materials. And the materials are from all the seasons, and the object uh, of this, the objective of this part of the season was to get nice photographs and scans of all the nice pieces together so we can use them for publication. So this is an example of the little hooks, the big hooks, the ones with the, the, the rolled over edge complete rods. Um, we have quite a number of complete objects um, which were it was important to document. Uh, we also have a lot of materials from different manufacturing stages which are broken hooks that may have been recycled and bent hooks and then these might be rods that were in the preparation for making hooks so these are things that Professor Katani and I are going to be working on to try to document the whole process of hook making. We also found a lot of sheet fragments of copper and also um, some pieces of melted, uh, remelted copper. So this is a um, lump of melted copper that has been poured out from a mold. So um, a lot of these fragments appear to be part of a recycling process. And when we start looking at the total objects, we find um, a large number of hooks, so 63, 61% of the Objects relate to rods or hooks, which relate to fishing um, material production. Um, very small amount are blades and sheets. We have 25% uh, of the material is our miscellaneous fragments, which are part of the recycling process. We have about 294 complete or almost complete fish hooks, which provide us measurements. So we'll have a good uh, idea of the range of sizes that were being used at the site. Um, moving to lithics, we're still in the process of fin finishing a detailed stratigraphic study of the lithics, but basically we have um, a number of different types of, of flint being used, uh, reddish flint, gray, black flint, model flint, and then the ras aljins flint. And we've been able to find the source for the reddish brown flint, which was I reported last um, uh, conference about 22 kilometers away in the low hills here at the edge of the Al Hajar mountains. And then the Ras Al Jins flint actually comes from, you can, you can get it near HD6, which is right here, or you can get it from large outcrops as far away as Ras Al Jins. So the people at the site were probably getting it from anywhere in this area along the coast. Uh, there's also this blackish colored flint, which might come from Wadi Shab, which is further up the coast. Um, and there's some other models chert which we're not sure exactly where it comes from. The tools that are dominant in the assemblage are bores of different sizes. We've talked about this in previous um, uh, conferences, uh, which were used for perforating and uh, conus, and then also some smaller ones that might have been used for drilling. Uh, we also have a, a number of different types of retouch flakes, which have notches for probably woodworking, uh, convex edges for, for other types of activity, could, could be leatherworking. Then three unique types of, um, or two, two examples of a unique type of object, which has three points and a kind of a triangular shape or a pyramidical shape. And we have no idea what these are for, so if anybody has an idea, please let us know. Um, Lots of drills of different sizes and persoirs. So drills we're calling little things, and the big ones that are pointed are persoirs. And they are in a, a wide range of sizes. Um, none of them appear to be used for actually drilling stone beads, but they probably were used for a shell or bone. And um, the flint counts are, are interesting because we've been able to now tabulate all the flint from all the excavations. And they show different, slightly different proportions, and I don't have time to go into it, but uh, this is in the northern part of the top of the mound. Um, slightly different proportion of borers. Uh, this is trench M, which has the largest number of materials. 
trench A and M are relatively similar. Um, but then if you go to the trenches on the edges of the mound, even though there's a very small amount of lithics, the proportions of bores are much less. So this suggests that there's a lot of activity going on in the central part of the mound over different time periods uh, and less activity out on the periphery. Um, preliminary lithic tabulation has also been done and I again, won't go into the details but we have total counts of everything and well as well as percentages both in terms of weight we've weighed everything and we've also have the counts so we can understand the proportions of materials by counts as well as by weights and you'll see that the trenches in the center part of the mound C A and M have about the same proportion of debitage to finished tools um, whereas the, the smaller trenches, which have, again, very small samples, but they have very different ratios of materials to uh, raw material to uh, finished tools. We're still working on the study of the beads. I haven't gotten the final LAICPMS data back. This is a slide I presented last year, but we are sourcing the beads, and we have definitely Indus-sourced beads and Iran-sourced beads, carnelian, which are at the site. And this season we found two more beads. One of them is lighter uh, colored carnelian, which might be from Iran. It also has a drilling technique using two sizes of drills and then popped out from one side, which is not a normal Indus technique. And the other bead, which is dark red carnelian, which is very similar to Indus style carnelian or from Gujarat, has more of an Indus style drilling with uh, what might be a constricted drill on one side and a worn-out uh, constricted drill on the other. Um, we have uh, some glazed steatite and also some fired white steatite, which um, we're hoping to be able to analyze in more detail, but this is the first one that we have that still has the glaze on the outside. Um, I thought it was faience at first, but it's, I think it is steatite. But the most of our beads are chlorite, which means that the most the dominant material from this site is, is material from local sources, and when you look at it, 40% or almost 41% uh, of the beads are chlorite from all the different seasons. So carnelian is not um, a very important bead type. Sorry. Um, moving to the pottery, I'm not going to go into great detail because um, there's too much to talk about, but basically I mentioned we had more Indus pottery and Umanar pottery from this season, and the most important discovery was the the sherd that Greg found on the surface, which is this one, and then the two sherds that match it from the excavation, which end up having an Indus writing on it. So this is the first example of uh, beautiful Indus writing on pottery. Uh, what's important is that this type of writing in big form on pottery with painting is not common in the Indus. So finding it in Oman is important, and we have to do a lot more research to understand it's its context and its meaning and try to link these signs up with possible signs on seals. We've done a complete tabulation of the pottery and um, black slip jars are an important um, large number of, of the, of the sherds. Um, there are more sherds of local pottery than Indus, uh, which would be understandable, but the large number of black slip jars is still something we need to understand. and. Um, I, I've looked at the number of rims. We don't have that many rims, so this large number of sherds could be just a few pots that have been broken up into lots of small, small pieces. We're still continuing with the study of the neutron activation. We've added more samples. We're collecting these uh, for continued analysis, and we will be doing residue analysis. And finally, the area that I thought might have been a concrete water channel at the edge of the site is probably the solid rock of the peninsula here. And so this might be the actual edge of the um, peninsula, and this is where the lagoon would come in. And we will have to do future studies using uh, GPR and other techniques to determine the edges of the ancient lagoon, which is something that I think we should do in the future. So that's it for, for our report, and thank you very much for uh, your attention. Bye-bye.